No, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was good. Good job. Patch the Pirate Club. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. All right. Good to see everybody in church tonight. We have some visitors with us, and we'd like to recognize them. It's so good to have with us tonight Jamie and Crystal Davis. I believe that's them right here on this side. So good to have them visiting with us tonight. They're visiting all the way from Green Pond, South Carolina, and we just want you guys to know that we're very happy to have you with us tonight. May the Lord bless you for being here. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, good to see everyone in church tonight. And tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to uh, give you a, a report on the, uh, uh, our little uh, Paraguay missions trip. And uh, brethren, I tell you, we, we had a wonderful trip. And uh, oh, one thing before I get into it, I'm supposed to do this. I need, let's take care of this tonight. I need two volunteers. If you, if you like something, a little something you can do to be a blessing to the church, a little ministry, I need two volunteers tonight that would be willing to, anytime we have visitors in church, pass out the invitation cards. We had uh, someone assigned to do that, but with uh, her Sunday school duties and the other sister being uh, uh, with her secretarial duties, she, they're not able to, to do that as consistently as they'd like to because they're having to run around and do different things. And so it'd be a blessing if we can get two people that could share the load. Let me get two volunteers tonight. Who would be willing to make that a ministry? All you do is, as soon as you see visitors coming to the church for the first time, okay, we got two right here in the front. Brother Charlie and? Oh, okay, Sister Peg. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a done deal. We'll leave it to you two. We'll, we'll get two. Oh. <laughs> All right. Amen. We, uh, we had a good trip, brethren. And um, we saw a lot of things accomplished. We, uh, we saw souls saved. We saw folks baptized. And uh, we were able to ordain 11 souls saved, 10 converts that were baptized, two men ordained into the gospel ministry. Amen. And uh, it was a blessing to us in particular because we were able to get some closure on that chapter of our life. We were able to close it, close that chapter the right way. Not that we're totally done uh, with anything as far as the mission field is concerned. And I'll explain that in just a minute. But as far as our work, uh, our last term uh, down in South America, as far as our work, as missionaries on the field, uh, for, for now it looks like our time with that is done, as the Lord has now brought us here to serve in the pastorate of Calvary Baptist Church. But it was, so, it was such a blessing to be able to go back, and there were so many mixed emotions, you know, so many things that went down. T 2020 was a crazy year for everybody, for everybody. And the way that we left the country due to all the, you know, the borders closing down, all the COVID things going on, it was a wild ride. And then the, from that point and then coming back to Beaufort and then before you know it, now you guys have voted us in to, uh, uh, for me to take the church and the pastorate. And, but I, I just didn't feel like we were able to really get closure on our work down in Paraguay. But this last week, we were able to get that accomplished. Amen. And so I give the Lord all the praise for that. And what I want to do is I want to take you through. I threw a little slide presentation together uh, at the last minute today. Uh, nothing fancy, but just a bunch of pictures to show you uh, what, what all went down in our trip down in South America. And then we'll just kind of segue that into a little mini message, and then we'll call it a night. But... Uh, so uh, here we are getting ready to perform surgery. <laughs> and uh, the restrictions nowadays, I tell you what, the, uh, all the loop, all the holes that you have to, you know, all the hoops you got to jump through uh, nowadays, they must have checked our paperwork a dozen times uh, going through the different airports now. 
It's crazy. Traveling was was never really all that easy ever since 9-11 with all the protocol that they put in place. Man, if you thought that was something, there is protocol after protocol. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And everywhere we went, man, we had to wear masks. There were people that had this face shield and were wearing two masks underneath the face shield. And uh, it was it's, it's crazy. And uh, if you don't think, brethren, uh, if you don't think that the devil is used, is taking advantage of the situation to get this world ready for when someone shows up and starts making some real demands. You, you see all this crazy stuff that there's no logic behind it. There, what's, the, what's the rationale behind some of these rules? Because a lot of them don't even make any sense. You know, the, the, and, and listen, the, the COVID, we're not trying to belittle. Uh, the COVID is a serious disease. We just lost a very good friend of ours here just last week. And that was very sad and very tragic. So we're not denying how serious that sickness is. But I tell you what, you're blind as a bat if you can't see how the governments, wicked, corrupt governments are just taking advantage of this situation and using this uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, uh, so-called, to uh, gain more power and more control. And uh, it's just it's just crazy. And so you better get make a long story short. You better get saved. And tonight would be a good night to get saved. Because uh, some real things are going to start coming on the horizon real soon. And you, you want to be ready for that. But uh, we traveled to uh, Plantation, Florida on a Wednesday. We stayed the night there we, with, a, with a very lovely Jamaican couple uh, that are saved. Uh, uh, had a wonderful time f fellowshipping with them. We went to church, to their church uh, down in uh, Plantation, Florida. And uh, my good friend, Dr. Steven Ziner, he's been here before. Some of you remember him. He's a director of Bearing Precious Sea Global. He preached uh, that night, preached a good message, and we had a good time uh, in the Lord. And then on Thursday, we traveled to Paraguay. And uh, the Friday and Saturday night, uh, one of the churches that we worked with. Now, in our time in Paraguay, we worked with uh, one, two, three, four, five different churches, okay? And this was, in this picture here, is one of the churches. This is actually an old picture. I just want to show you the church where uh, they had a revival meeting for Friday and Saturday night. This is a picture of uh, the Bible Institute uh, that we uh, operated down in Paraguay, South America. And uh, we had over 30 students. Uh, on the first day, uh, we had uh, over 50 students that signed up. Of course, you know how that works. People start dropping out. But uh, we, had a, we had a bunch of folks that uh, we were able to, to disciple and train for the ministry. And it was so good uh, those first couple of nights uh, to uh, spend time with that church and to see that ministry going forward uh, and with their own leadership and uh, celebrating their fifth year anniversary, anniversary. That was a blessing. And then on, uh, during the day, uh, we, we were able to travel to the town. There's a town... Uh, in the sort in the center of Paraguay. Now, where is Paraguay located? Uh, if you look at on a map, if you look at South America, and you look right in the middle of South America, you'll see Brazil, and right underneath Brazil, you'll see Paraguay. It's a small country with a population of about seven million souls, and uh, in the capital area, near about thirty minutes from the capital, we were able to plant a church. Here's the church sign. Iglesia Bautista Cristo Vive, which is Spanish for Christ Lives Baptist Church, and that's located in the town of Nimbu, Puerto Rico, uh, Paraguay. And, uh, and then uh, during the day, we were able to uh, uh, fellowship with uh, Dr. Steven Ziner and also uh, a, a young uh, a couple. Now, this brother that's sitting next to me, his name is Brother Julio Jara. And I wanted to show you guys a picture of Brother Julio because Brother Julio was a great blessing to me. He was, a, he was one of my, probably my best right-hand man. He was just a right arm in the ministry. And this man uh, stood for us and helped us in so many ways, helped us to plant uh, two churches uh, on the mission field. And so uh, one thing about Brother Julio that we had been praying about during our whole time down there in our last term on the mission field, uh, Brother Julio was single. And so we had been praying for the Lord to provide for him a wife. And 
uh, in the last uh, several, uh, just a few months ago, uh, he finally found him a good godly Christian woman in a, in a good independent Baptist church that uh, we were friends with. And uh, there she is right there. And so that was an answer to prayer. But that's Brother Julio. And uh, he was a great blessing, a great help uh, in helping us establish two churches on the, on the mission field. Now, this is one of the nationals, Pastor Alejandro Monjes, that we just ordained this last week. That's him and his lovely wife, Sister Ingrid. And uh, they're a blessing, and they're the ones taking care of that church uh, there in Nimbu and uh, 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 at Christ Lives Baptist Church. And they're just doing a wonderful job, wonderful job. This is a young brother that uh, went to our Bible Institute. This is Brother Daniel. Uh, brother Daniel, was uh, he is the song leader in the church. And it, w it was just such a blessing to see uh, different folks that we had the opportunity to work with and to train for the ministry, uh, serving the Lord, going forward. And uh, that's Brother Daniel just doing a tremendous job leading the singing and being a right hand to the national pastor that's there and he preaches as well and so I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the road we're ordaining him into the ministry but so good to see these national men going forward and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ now on Sunday morning I preached in the church there uh, in Nimbu and this young man uh, after services this young 12 year old boy I forget the boy's name but Samuel 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 he came forward and asked if we would pray with him, and he trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And I wish you could have seen how happy his mother was, but she was just delighted to see her little boy uh, trust Jesus Christ as her Savior. So that was a great blessing. And then during the day, all day Sunday, the brethren uh, that were in church Sunday morning, they, we stayed in church all day until Sunday night. And that's something that you'll see uh, in some of these countries, uh, especially there in Paraguay, South America. Some folks, when church is over with, they love church so much, they'll just stay there at the church and they'll pitch in and, and, and to go get groceries, to, to make have lunch right there at the church, and they'll sleep there at the church. Some will sleep on the floor and they'll just fellowship, have a good time. They might play, some of the young men might play volleyball and just hang out at the church just to kill time, but they'll just stay there and fellowship uh, all day long. And so that that's what we did. Now, right next to the church is another piece of property owned by uh, someone else who's not associated with the church. But he had a uh, uh, he has a pool there, which was perfect for us uh, to be able to do baptisms. So uh, we now the Paraguayan people, OK, Latino people in general, they will use any occasion to turn it into a party. And so. When, we, when it was announced that we were going to be having baptisms, they brought out all kinds of steaks and all kinds of rib, ribs and, and, and meats, and, and they, ha, they made a big old cookout out of it. And so that's the way they do baptisms down there, and, and, and I wasn't opposed to it. I, I thought it was wonderful. And so here I am going down into to the pool. Now, the, the pool was so, when, when I got into the pool, I immediately started getting really nervous because the floor was extremely slippery. And, and as I got into the pool, I started thinking, how am I going to be able to hold these people up to baptize them? This is going to be so embarrassing when I go to baptize them and all, all of us uh, go down into the water together. And so thank the Lord at the ledge there, there was a little spot where I could sit down and I had the other national stand on the other side and I was able to hold on to the ledge while baptizing him and the other brother on the other side. So we had to kind of improvise a little bit, but, uh, but it worked out. Right before the baptisms, I told the national pastor, Pastor Alejandro Monjes, I said, I want you to take just a few minutes and uh, read to them Matthew chapter 28 uh, concerning the verses concerning baptism and just uh, give a brief little explanation of what baptism is all about. Of course, you know, these guys, they don't know what brief means, uh, kind of like me. And, and kind of like us around here. And so he let it rip, but he did a good job uh, discussing baptism. And uh, there's the crowd there as we fellowship. And you can see the grills fired up and all this. But we just had a great time in the Lord. Now, this is Sister Imelda Gomez. And we had her sing right before we did the baptisms. And uh, if you've, you've probably never heard Sister Imelda Gomez sing. But let me tell you something. She has just an angelic voice. I wish I could have played for you a video clip. I didn't have time to put 
all that together. But we had Sister Imelda Gomez. She is the wife of Brother Humberto Gomez, the missionary. His letter is over here on this side. The missionary that we support down in Mexico who's been serving there for, for over 40 years, uh, for fi about 50 years now. Brother Gomez uh, is one of our missionaries. And it was a, a blessing to be able to have him there to participate in these activities. Here are some of the folks that we baptized. You know what was a blessing, brethren? Was going there and seeing people that, that uh, seeing new faces and then seeing people that we had witnessed to before that were not saved when we left the country who are now saved. Amen. And uh, this is this fellow we're baptizing is Brother Francisco. Uh, we had preached to him. We had witnessed to Francisco and he was not saved when, when Marie and I left Paraguay. But Brother Alejandro and the people of the church, they stayed after him and, and he, he trusted Jesus Christ as a savior. And so here we are baptizing him. So that was a blessing. And if you'll notice, I brought both the national pastors, Brother Alejandro and Brother Arturo. That's the two national pastors we support in Paraguay. This was their first time baptizing folks. They wanted me to baptize everybody. And I said, you, what, I'm, what we're going to do is this. We have 10 new converts to baptize. I'm going to baptize the first few ones. And then I want you guys to baptize the rest of them so that you can get some practice and, 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 and learn to do that. So that was a blessing. Now, this brother, this fellow here that we're baptizing, this is Brother Antonio. Brother Antonio is a, another guy that we witnessed to that was not saved when we left Paraguay. Brother Antonio was an old drunk. This guy was a disaster, just a mess, always getting in fights with folks. I mean, just a devil. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't uh, have a whole lot of high hopes that he was going to get saved, which is always a mistake because God can save anybody. And uh, we've seen that over and over again. So it should not really should not surprise us. But this fellow was just just a mess. And he's in church now, all cleaned up, all sobered up. As a matter of fact, uh, a young lady that he had uh, that had been his girlfriend, uh, she got saved as well. And now they're getting ready to get married. And so here we are baptizing Brother Antonio. And that was just such a blessing, such a blessing to see folks that had gotten saved. Here's Brother Arturo's first time, uh, the national pastor that we support. Here's his first time baptizing someone. Here's a. Uh, uh, a young girl, uh, this is Brother Alejandro's daughter. What's her name again? Alani's. Alani's. This is, I mean, Clarissa. But she got saved uh, not too long ago. And this is her dad, uh, the national pastor, Brother Alejandro, baptizing her. So that was a precious moment. And then afterwards, we got done baptizing them and we sang some songs. Just a wonderful time in the Lord, brethren. And and then uh, we had Sunday night services after the cookout, after the uh, baptisms. Then we gathered back together in the church. And I had a good crowd for the little church uh, there. There's Brother Alejandro uh, addressing the crowd. But uh, good crowd in church that Sunday night. Here's Brother Danielle that I just mentioned earlier, uh, uh, doing a special with some of the young people in the church, just doing a good job. More crowd shots. And then on Monday night was the big night for, for me, uh, for us. It was uh, the night that we ordained Brother Arturo and Brother Alejandro into the gospel ministry. And that was a whole lot of fun. And Dr. Ziner, I had two guys preach that night. Brother Stephen Ziner was one of them. And uh, he said, I want these two guys to sit right up front. He said, because we got some things to tell these guys. And so there's Brother Alejandro and Brother Arturo listening and uh, there's Dr. Steven Ziner. You guys got to meet him early last year, but uh, it was a blessing to have Brother Ziner and Brother Gomez. I let them two give the charge to these national pastors. Between Brother Ziner and Brother Gomez, you have over 100 years of experience in the ministry. And so I told these nationals, one thing I try to drill into these national pastors is to make friends with older preachers that have stuck by the stuff. Uh, throughout the years you know in, in my time uh, during my time I've had brother Baker as a mentor and uh, I, I really believe that young preachers they need uh, older preachers that they can look up to and glean from and so I really tried my best to instill that within these these preachers to look up to these older men that have paid the price 
and so that they can learn from them, learn from their examples. Here's Dr. Humberto Gomez, our missionary to Mexico, uh, preaching to, to the crowd, preaching to the men, giving the charge. Of course, you know, I, I had something to say as well. And so just had a good time in the Lord. There's Brother Gomez and his wife singing a special. And then uh, after all the preaching, uh, we uh, laid hands on them and prayed over them and ordaining them into the ministry, just like the Bible teaches us to do there in Acts chapter number 13. We also had a, a time for questioning. Uh, we didn't do a whole bunch of that, but we set aside a few minutes so that the pastors present, there were four pastors present, actually five pastors present, but we gave the pastors that were present the opportunity to ask them a few questions. Now, uh, we didn't do a whole bunch of that because I had already made them fill out a questionnaire of, of just fundamental Bible doctrines. I, I didn't do it for myself because I already know what they believe because I taught them. But I wanted uh, them to have something in writing for the other pastors so that they can be comfortable because, you know, the Bible says lay hands suddenly on no man. You don't want to ordain somebody into the ministry if you don't know what they're about. And so uh, I, I did that. And now the thing about the pastors, they said, Brother Manny, we don't need to uh, do a whole bunch of questioning because we know you. We trust you. And if you train them, then we know what, what, they, what they believe and what they preach. But I still had them have some things in writing so that the preachers can read it and so that there would be no doubt about it. And uh, it was kind of funny because... These preachers, man, one thing about preachers, preachers love to preach. You give them uh, an inch and they'll take a mile. And so I told these guys, I want you to just answer these questions as briefly as possible. But these guys just could not help themselves but to turn every answer to a question into a, a short sermon. Uh, one of the guys, I had to cut him off. Uh, was one of the pastors asked him about the Lord's Supper to explain the symbolism of the Lord's Supper. And so he says, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That dude was about to read the whole chapter. And I, and I, I, said, I said, Brother Arturo, I said, look, you, you're going to have to cut this short, brother, or we're going to be here all night. We're never going to get to the two preachers that got to preach. And so, but we had a good time, good time in the Lord. And you know what? That's how you want preachers to be. You, you want, you want pre young preachers to have something to say. If you've got nothing to say, then we've got a problem. And so you want them to be full of the word of God. You want them to be excited and passionate about having something to say. And so here's uh, Brother Alejandro uh, receiving his certificate of ordination and Brother Gomez gifting them uh, a brand new uh, Bible in Spanish. Lorena Valera Gomez Bible. Here's Brother Arturo uh, receiving uh, uh, the same thing, certificate of ordination and a Bible from Brother Gomez. Here's Brother Alejandro. We gave them a few minutes afterwards to uh, give a quick word of testimony after the ordination. And you can see on Brother Alejandro's face how uh, emotional he was. Very emotional moment because these guys' lives are never going to be the same again. You're talking about a life-changing moment uh, being ordained into the gospel ministry. And so here's a picture of the uh, the... The national pastors with their wives. This is uh, Brother Arturo all the way on the, on, on the one end, uh, the far end of us with his wife, Sister Lucia. And then in the middle, Brother Alejandro and his wife, Sister Ingrid. Wonderful, wonderful ladies. Wonderful ladies. Here's a picture of their ordination certificates in the Bible that we gave them as a gift. Here's a picture of the two national pastors with their families uh, and their, their children. Good kids. All these Good kids. And this young man uh, standing on the side of Brother Alejandro, uh, I really believe that God is going to make a preacher out of him. He's already preaching. He's only 16 years old and he's already got a desire to preach the word of God. I tell you what, we need more 16 year olds here in the United States willing to give their lives to the gospel ministry. Wouldn't that be a blessing? And uh, here's a picture of us with some of the folks uh, from the church. Precious people. And uh, here's the ladies here taking a picture with Sister Maria. And one of the things that was a blessing, you know, uh, the ladies really looked up to Maria during our time on the mission field. And that's very important. And uh, but what was a blessing to me was seeing these newer ladies that have gotten saved recently. They're now looking up to Sister Ingrid. Sister Ingrid looked up to Maria and learned a lot from her. And now she's got these other new young ladies looking up to her as the pastor's wife. And to me, that was a blessing to see that happening. 
Just a blessing to see how the Lord was working, is, is working in his church. Now here is an, the other church out uh, on, on Tuesday night uh, or Tuesday afternoon. We went deeper into the country, okay? Deeper into the country of Paraguay in the interior. And that's where Brother Arturo has his church, uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church. Okay, so here's Brother Arturo, the national pastor, putting up a, a tarp because uh, we were anticipating that the, the room where they normally would have services, we were anticipating that we weren't going to have enough space in there to house everyone that was going to show up for the church services. So that's a wonderful problem to have. And so Brother Arturo, here he is putting up a tarp so that we can have services outside. And uh, there's a picture of the place uh, that we're renting uh, where they have church with the tarp up. And uh, we took a minute right before we went out to pick folks up for church. We took a minute to pray over a piece of property that we own. We own a piece of property there in Arroyo Z Estetos is the name of the town. And uh, on this piece of property, they are planning on building a church uh, real soon. And so uh, we need to be in prayer, in much prayer uh, with them about, about that so that they could quit investing all this money into other people's pockets and instead they could invest it in their own church that they could call home. And so there we are praying about that matter. Here's a picture of one of the homes of one of the church members. And uh, this is where uh, an elderly fellow by the name of Justo, Brother Justo, Don Justo lives. And there's Brother Alejandro, the national pa pastor, greeting him and, and uh, taking him to church. Here's a picture of the crowd. And what was such a blessing, as you look at this crowd, I mean, it was, it was a packed house. Okay, we filled up that whole front yard uh, with people. And this is a church that was started from absolutely nothing. I mean, there were times where it was just us and one other person. Brother Julio just preaching to one person plus us in the crowd. And, uh, and now to see the place, uh, to not even have enough room in the area. Now, it's a still a small church, but to see them outgrowing the, the place that they're renting to have church services, to see from where it started, that was a great blessing. And so here's just another crowd shot. And uh, there's the national pastor, Brother Arturo, leading the singing, doing a great job out there. There's Sister Melda Gomez and Brother Gomez singing a special now, this is uh, Brother Axel Trepovich. He's an evangelist. He's a, he's a Costa Rican brother, uh, but he's a member of a church up in Connecticut that supported us for many years. And uh, a Brother Axel preached. We let him preach that night, did a wonderful job. We saw five souls saved that night. There's Brother Gomez. Uh, he, after Brother Axel preached, Brother Gomez came up and gave his testimony of how he came to know the Lord as his Savior. And then after the services that night, we went out and uh, had some fellowship with the pastors and a couple of the national uh, pastors as well. Just had a good time in the Lord. Another picture there of uh, the people that uh, there from the church in, in Nimbu, Christ Lives Baptist Church. I think that's it for the slides. And so, brother, we had a wonderful time. We saw 11 souls. You could get the, turn the lights back on. We saw 11 uh, professions of faith. We saw uh, 10 people get baptized. And the, the, again, the wonderful thing about the souls that we saw baptized, even though we had witnessed to them, but it was really the nationals that led them to the Lord. Amen. And so that was a great blessing to see these nationals uh, doing the job and, and going out there and beating the bushes and shaking the bushes and, 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 and doing the best they can to get the gospel out and then seeing fruit for their labor was a wonderful blessing for us, brethren. We had a wonderful time. If you'll go to Philippians chapter 1, we're about done tonight. But like I said, brethren, it was a blessing. It, we were able to get some much needed closure, even though we still have some things that we wish to accomplish and, and to do from a distance. Um, you know, I was, as we uh, discussed all the souls that had come forward to get saved and seeing all the fruit of new converts getting baptized and men being ordained to the ministry. Somebody said to me here recently, well, that's, you're probably 
uh, questioning whether or not <laughs> when you see all the fruit going on in the mission field, it's probably causing you to question whether or not you made the right decision to come uh, pastor here in the, in the United States, you know, whether or not you probably would, would rather be over there. But to be honest with you, brethren, actually the opposite is true. Actually, the opposite is true. Uh, let me explain. Uh, what the Lord showed us, and I really believe that the Lord did this. Number one, he did it for their souls. They need to be saved. Amen. That's the number one thing. But I really think that the Lord worked also to help put, our, put ourselves at ease and at peace with that uh, chapter in our lives. Because what the Lord showed us through all of this fruit that abounds to his, uh, to, unto his glory, what the Lord showed us is that, you know what, God's in control and everything's going to be just fine with these churches. Uh, that was always the burden of my heart. Uh, there's, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about all the different people that the Lord has allowed us to minister to up in the mountains of Puerto Rico, in, deep in the, countries, uh, in the country of South America. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about these people, that I don't think about the different individuals and the different trials and tribulations that we went through with some of them and the moments of joy that we went through when we saw them get saved. There's not a day that goes by that we don't have them on our hearts and on our minds. And, and that's a good thing because what that does is it motivates you to be constantly in prayer for them. But uh, it was a good thing to be down there and to see the Lord working. I think it was just the Lord's way of confirming in our hearts that, listen, don't you worry about these works. You did the best you could. You invested what you did to bring them to a certain point. Now, don't worry about it. I'm going to take it from here. It's kind of the message I felt like the Lord was getting across to us. And so I'm very thankful, brethren. I'm very thankful. Uh, and I appreciate you guys allowing us to go down there to be able to take care of that business because, like I said, it really put us at peace. We had a lot of mixed emotions, a lot of mixed emotions going there, but the timing was right, and it was just a blessing to be able to encourage the brethren. And, you know, it was mixed emotions on, on, on their behalf as well because, they, as you can imagine, they're, they're, gonna, they, they're missing us. They're going to miss us, and they said as much. And, uh, but I, what I explained to them is this. I said, you know, when you read the book of Acts, what you read in the book of Acts, you read about the first missionaries. That's what you're reading about in the book of Acts. You're reading about the first missionaries in the church era, okay? Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, who you could say is the first missionary of them all. What did he do? He did what all missionaries did. He left his home to go to a far country to take the truth, the message of the gospel to a people of a foreign land. Basically, that's exactly what Jesus did. And then when you read the book of Acts, you find that's what the apostles did. You read about the first and second missionary journeys of the apostle Paul. Before Paul's time, you read of missionary uh, endeavors uh, through the original disciples and their converts. But then you go to the apostle Paul and you read about his uh, different journeys uh, and how he took the gospel to different, different areas and how he took it all the way to, a, to other continents. And so that's, that's mission work. And what, but what I explained to the people while I was there, I said, listen, uh, when you study the life of Paul and the other missionaries, you'll find that God took these men of God, he took them to certain areas, and they would go to those areas, they would preach the gospel, they would see souls saved, they would get them baptized, they would disciple them, and then with those new converts, they would form new churches with those converts. But then after a few years of working in those areas, they would leave those churches in the hands of national pastors so that the work can go on and so that they can leave and go other places so they can either start new works or reestablish uh, other works. And, uh, and if you'll read in the Pauline epistles, you'll find that Paul the Apostle constantly said this. He, he was constantly telling the people in his epistles that I have a, a great desire to be with you. I have a great desire to visit you. And I, I, I'm nothing like the Apostle Paul by no means. But I think I understand at least what he felt like. Because I, I, as I explained to the nationals down there, I really believe that my role now in the ministry is, is similar to that of the Apostle Paul. It's not exactly the same because now I'm serving as a pastor here in the United States. But Paul's role after he got those churches planted and established, his role was to, he had a desire to go back to those churches for the purpose of encouraging those people. 
And I feel like that's what my role is now, is to uh, do what I can. I like to go back. When I get a chance, I like to go back. If the Lord doesn't come back first. Now, if the Lord comes back, and he's probably going to come back real soon. He's probably going to be back before this night's over with. So you might as well get ready. But if the Lord doesn't come back first, uh, I would like to make it a point to go back to some of these places. I'd love to go back to Puerto Rico. I'd love to go back to Paraguay for just a few days and just do what I can to be an encouragement to these national pastors. They need encouragement. And uh, I, I think that that's something that I can do going forward uh, to contribute uh, to the mission field. If you'll look at the book of Philippians, if you'll look at Philippians, you'll find the word gospel is mentioned several times. And if you look at Philippians chapter number one, look at verse number five. He says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Notice he mentions your fellowship in the gospel. You know what's so wonderful about the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel solves problems Amen. that higher learning and education cannot solve. That psychology cannot solve, that philosophy cannot solve, that uh, religion cannot solve. The gospel solves problems that man cannot solve. What am I talking about? You know what the gospel does? It brings people together. Amen. There's a lot of folks, even look at this building right now. Look at the congregation that we have tonight. Some of you guys are from the city, some of you guys are from the country, some of you guys are from the south, and some of you guys are from the north. And it's a miracle that civil war has not broken out just yet. But you got people in this crowd alone from all types of different walks of life, from with all kinds of backgrounds. You've got some of you guys, some of you guys uh, lived a life of, of, of crime and, and have a rough background growing up on the streets and, and, and just a terrible background and all of this that the Lord saved you out of. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And then you've got others that grew up in church all their life. They've never smoked a cigarette. They've never drank uh, alcohol. But they found out one day that they were just as wicked as these other ones that had to get saved from off the streets. And you've got all kinds of different backgrounds. And you know what? Had it not been for the gospel of Jesus Christ, there, it's more than likely that we would have never had met one another. And yet because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, here we are. Amen. Amen. Here we are, fellowshipping one with another. You've got people from all over the world just right here in this little congregation. What a blessing. I'll never forget, Brother Baker told the story about when he went to Papua New Guinea to uh, preach over there. And Brother Wayne Fair had set up a, 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 a revival meeting. And they had invited all these different tribes. And they had four tribes in particular that were present. And so as Brother Baker preached, they had to have actually three translators to translate it into the language of each of the different groups that were there represented. I've translated for preachers, but I've never been in a situation uh, where you had uh, not just one, but two and then three translators. And so you can only imagine uh, what that must have been like. And I'll tell you this, too. I've translated for a lot of preachers, a lot of preachers, and I like to do that. I like the challenge of translating for a preacher. But one of the hardest preachers I've ever had to translate for was Brother Baker because he doesn't know when to be quiet and give you a chance to, to get a word in because he'll just go on and on. The, the, there's an art to translating. You say a couple sentences and then you give the translator a, a, a minute so that he can tell the people what you just said. Well, Brother Baker doesn't understand that. So he just goes on and on and on and on. And so you just finally just got to get rude and just cut him off. And, but he's spitting out so much stuff uh, so fast. And so eventually you just start making up stuff. <laughs> And so I can only imagine with three poor translators trying to translate for this guy, that must have been a fiasco. But I'll never forget uh, the testimony of what Brother Wayne Fair said after the service was over with. They had a good service. People got saved. Good meeting and all of this. And Brother Wayne Fair, uh, with tears in his eyes, you know how Brother Wayne Fair is. He's always got tears in his eyes. And Brother Wayne, he tells Brother Baker, he says, Brother Baker, I don't think you even understand the magnitude of what happened here tonight. He said, but let me explain. You see these different tribes, there's four tribes here represented tonight. Do you realize that these four, these four tribes are in war right now with one another? <laughs> these four tribes are in war with one another 
But when they heard that the white men were going to be putting up a tent and holding a revival meeting, they decided to lay their weapons aside just for a minute so that they could satisfy their curiosity and see what the missionaries are doing. And you know what that is? That's the power of the gospel. The, you know what the power of the gospel did? It brought people that were hating one another. They're at each other's throats. They're at war with one another. But for the gospel's sake, they said, you know what? We want to go hear what those preachers have to say. And so the Holy Spirit drew them in and brought four tribes that are at war with each other to, to be well, one, uh, amongst each other in peace. And instead of being at each other's throat trying to kill each other, instead, they're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't you know some of them got saved and boy, Boy, that put their war in the pickle because now that you get saved, once you get saved, you become brothers in Christ. Amen. What am I saying? The gospel solves problems that society doesn't know how to deal with. Right. Amen. We see the fellowship. We see our fellowship in the gospel. But not only that, look at verse number seven. We're almost done. Stay with me. Look at verse seven. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Boy, I can understand that. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Notice not only the fellowship of the gospel, but now Paul mentions the defense of the gospel. And that's our job. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Jude said to earnestly, earnestly contend for the faith. What does the word earnest mean? It means to put your heart into this thing. It means to, to, to get fired up. I tell you, that's what we need. We've got too many Christians that are asleep nowadays. Some of you need to wake up, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. It's time for some Christians to wake up from their spiritual slumber and to get busy about the things of God. Amen. Get fired up. We get fired up about our favorite sports team and we get fired up about the boxing event and all kinds of junk and, and that don't amount to nothing and they surely have no bearing upon anything eternal and we get fired up about materialistic things and listen, you know, I, I kind of hit materialism a little bit this morning. Let me explain something to you. There's nothing wrong with getting a nice house or a nicer house. There's nothing wrong if you can afford without getting into a bunch of debt. If you can afford to get you a nicer vehicle and have some nicer things and you're not a lazy bum and you work hard for it, I believe in a hard working man. The Bible talks a whole lot about the virtue of being diligent and working to provide for your own. And so if you if you're earning if you're if you're making an honest living and, and you can afford to have some nicer things in life, there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing that makes anything like that wrong is when you begin to put those things before God. You understand what I'm saying? There are so many people that uh, those things are the real priority in your life. Let me tell you something. The priority of your life ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The priority of your life ought to be God's will for your life. And if, if these other things are getting in the way, are getting in the way uh, of you being able to be obedient and to be able to fulfill God's will for your life, then you've got a problem. It's time to take a second look at some of these things. Perhaps some of these things you might need, need to even have to get rid of. You know what maturity is? Maturity is when you come to the place in your Christian life where you not just get rid of bad things, but perhaps even some things that are not so bad, but, th but you get rid of those things so that you can spend more time in prayer and the word of God and in the things of God and his work. That would be maturity. The, he mentions the defense of the gospel. Earnestly. Contend for the faith. What does that mean? We need to get the truth out there. Hey, it's a shame when the Jehovah's Witnesses work harder to get their false doctrines out than we do with the truth. It's a shame when the Mormons will, will work harder than Bible-believing Christians are to, to promote their falsehoods. And yet here we are with the truth. I tell you, we ought to have more enthusiasm. That's what earnestly contend means, to do it with enthusiasm. We get so enthusiastic about all kinds of other temporary things, and yet we, we lack passion, we lack energy, we lack uh, enthusiasm when it comes to the things of God. Hey, let me tell you something. No, nothing ought to excite you more than the, the things of the Lord, Amen. like the Bible, like prayer, like church. You ought to be excited to go to church. Hey, listen, going to church is the highlight of my week. 
to be able to go to church and see my friends and see my brothers and sisters in Christ and to be able to sing the songs of Zion. And wasn't it a blessing to hear the little children singing songs unto the Lord and then to hear young ladies singing specials and the piano player playing on the piano and to hear the preaching of the word of God. Hey, listen, these things ought to be exciting to you. And if these things are not as exciting to you as you know that they should be in your life, it's because you're backslidden and you, it's time to get right with God about some things. Amen. He talks about the defense of the gospel. The defense of the gospel. Brother Arturo, one of our national pastors, we uh, had bought a, uh, a van for him to use to be able to pick folks up because he had folks... Wanting to come to church. Most people walk to church or take a bus or a taxi to church over there. Most people don't have transportation like you and I do over here. Okay. But now there are other people that live a little farther out. And the only way they're going to be able to make it to church is if someone goes and gets them. Okay. So we had bought a, a, a vehicle, but it turned out to be a piece of junk. It was a very bad purchase. Waste of money. Waste of money. And so... When that van broke down, we were already back in, I, I think that was during the time that I was hopping around Mexico wondering what the world is going on, as the world was going nuts with the COVID thing going on. And uh, uh, we got word that that van had broke down. You know what Arturo did? He got on his bicycle throughout the week to go visit all the people in his church and minister to them in their home. He got on his bicycle in 100 degree weather in the height of summertime uh, to go and witness the folks. And yet we can't even get people to uh, participate in evangelism efforts in air conditioned vehicles. Amen. That's right. Hey, listen, uh, shame on us when we're not doing what we should to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. The false crowd are doing everything they can to get their falsehoods out. I tell you, we need to do what we can to get the truth out. Amen. And then notice, finally, look at verse 12. And this is what I want to get you to in regards to our time down in Paraguay. This is what was on my heart. Look at verse 12. He says, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So he mentions the fellowship of the gospel in verse 5, the defense of the gospel in verse 7, and then in verse 12 he mentions the furtherance of the gospel. And now in the context, Paul the Apostle, is, 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 is he's talking about the fact that he was in prison at that time which was a very unfortunate thing. He was suffering persecution for the cause of Christ and was unjustly thrown into prison simply for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was illegal in the Roman Empire back in that day, in that paganistic environment. And so Paul the Apostle says, you know what? Uh, I've been thrown into prison. I'm suffering persecution for the gospel's sake, but don't you worry about it. All the things that are happening to me, God has allowed these circumstances to happen in my life simply to make me more available to get the gospel out. Because of, because of my situation, this is going to open for me new doors so that I can give the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that I otherwise probably would have never had the opportunity to meet. And through, through, his, through being thrown in prison, Paul the Apostle had the door open unto him to be able to uh, witness to dignitaries, important people, governors, politicians, and even a Roman emperor. And what am I saying? My brethren, sometimes you're going to go through some things in your life. It may, they may be trials and tribulations. And they may not be the most easiest thing to go through. But if you'll just soldier on, like the Bible says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you'll endure it, if you'll put up with it, if you'll have patience, and if you'll persevere, You'll begin to realize things will become clearer and you'll begin to realize that, you know what? God has allowed these things to happen in my life so that I can be more useful to the Lord for the gospel's sake. Persevere. Perseverance. That was what my, perhaps my main message when I was uh, ministering to those nationals and to the people in the churches. On Sunday morning, I preached on brotherly love and unity. Just trying to encourage the church, hey, stick together. You guys need each other. The missionary's not going to be here now. I'll do my best to come back and visit you. But now you're on your own. It's, it's you guys and the Lord. 
And guess what? If you have the Lord, you've got all you need. But I try to encourage them. Hey, stick with each other. Help one another. Support one another. Love one another. The problem with too many churches is instead of loving one another and supporting one another and encouraging one another, we bite and devour one another and break each other down and criticize and murmur and complain. I'm telling you, the church cannot be healthy in an environment like that. There has to be unity in the church. And so I tried my best to encourage them to remain a unified church so that they can have victory over the enemy. And then I preached on Sunday morning. I preached on the church will prevail. On that promise that the Lord gave in Matthew 16, 18, he said that the gates of hell, he said upon this rock, Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. What a, pro what a wonderful promise that is. And I tried my best to encourage the church that, look, if you'll just go forward, if you'll just keep going forward, forward and if you'll soldier on, if you'll persevere, you'll see God's blessings upon this church. You'll continue to see more souls saved. I told them, don't get content. We, today, uh, we had a great day of victory, I told them last Sunday. We're, we're going to get to baptize 10 new converts to the Lord. 10 new converts to the Lord. That's a big deal. I said, but you know what? Don't get satisfied with that. Go out and get 10 more. Amen. Go out and get 10 more. We've got work to do and we must persevere because the devil's not happy with all this fruit that we're seeing to the glory of, of the Lord. And so you need to perse persevere through that stuff. And sometimes you're going to go through some circumstances and you're going to go through some hard times and you're going to go through some setbacks and you're going to go through some challenges. Just bear in mind, dear Christian, that perhaps God is on purpose allowing you to go through these things because through these things, he's going to open up great doors of opportunity for you in the service of the Lord. So be sensitive to the leadership of the Lord, the furtherance of the gospel. I explained to those nationals, I really believe that uh, God has allowed things to go the, the way that it did so that for the furtherance of the gospel, so that you guys can go on and you guys can become stronger in the Lord. But I also think that God has put me in a position now as I'm pastoring here in the United States, there's things that I can do on this side for the gospel's sake. Amen. You know, I'm done tonight, brother. We're done. We'll close in a word of prayer in just a minute. But, you know, a lot of pastors, different pastors have different things that they emphasize. And some pastors, they, they have a great emphasis on sound doctrine. And I think that ought to be the emphasis of every Bible-believing church. Amen. Sound doctrine is how a church will we'll, we'll be strengthened, okay? We must be strong in the faith. And some, some preachers are real big about that. Then you get some pastors, they're real big about the family, real big about the home, about marriage. And that's a very important subject. The church will only be as strong as the families in that church. And then you get some preachers, they're real big about soul winning and evangelism. And that's another topic that every, uh, every church ought to make a priority in their church because it's what it's all about, getting folks to the Lord, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then you get some pastors that are, are, are big on missions. And they just really have a heart for missions. And I think, brethren, uh, the things that the Lord has allowed me to experience on the mission field, these things are going to be with me for the rest of my life. And I'm content with that, my brethren. And let, uh, listen, brethren, what am I trying to say? As a church, let's do the best we can to stay focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beaufort, South Carolina has too many people that have yet not trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Well, you know, we've got a good crowd here tonight for a Sunday night. I, I know that we're missing uh, a lot of folks, but I'm happy to see you here tonight. But we've got a lot of spaces on these pews that need to be filled up, as I mentioned this, early, this morning. Let's do what we can to bring people in, one by one. Like I told the National, I said, listen, it's one by one. It's one by one. We started this church, and there was only one person that showed up sometime. But we stuck with it. You guys stayed with it. You kept preaching. You kept getting the tracks out. You kept inviting folks out. And at times where it seems like nothing was moving and nothing was happening, you kept soldiering on. And today, you get to enjoy the fruits of our labor. And all the glory goes to God. Amen. But you would have never made it to this point if you didn't soldier on. 
My brethren, let's soldier on for the glory of God. Let's win Beaufort, South, South Carolina to the Lord. Amen. And then let's do what we can to have a vision to see soul, soul saved, not just here in Beaufort, South Carolina, but all throughout the world. These missionaries are dependent on us. Now let's do the best we can to be faithful on our front so that they'll be faithful on their front. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. Amen. Brother Kenny, would you close us with prayer, please? Lord, Father, we do thank you again for just giving us a good day in church, Lord. Blessings of preaching. And Lord, the testimonies, Lord, of these men in Paraguay, Lord. Lord, help us not to dwell on other people's successes or things, but Lord, help us to to get out there and do something for you also. Amen. Just thank you for us. Bless us this week, Lord, in the business that needs to be done, in our, in our jobs, in our lives, Lord, and bring us back together again safely. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you.